ladies and gentlemen, may I invite you to a journey in a time machine, kindly asking you to imagine the year of 1949. It is the beginning of September, and the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe, the predecessor of our host today, is in session discussing the draft of a treaty, namely the Future Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. A French MP takes the floor to point out the essence of the whole system of protection of human rights envisaged by the draft, which is the subject of the deliberations. His name is André Philippe. He wants to describe the functioning of the European Court of Human Rights as shaped by the Convention draft. And in doing so, he tackles what, in his opinion, is the core element of the entire system of the human rights protection and says as follows. It is that when a fundamental freedom has been violated, an individual, even the most humble, even the weakest, may be able to come before the court as an equal to the greatest state or the most powerful government. Philippe's words clearly disclose the most important point of the long-lasting story of human rights. It has always been about the weak and the mighty, and the idea of human rights appears in it as a means of providing arms to the former against the latter. As the dominant issue of the story has always remained the same, the idea has preserved its main feature ever since the time of its birth. If we are to consider the birth of human rights, it suffices to say that it cannot be properly traced back to a certain period of time or region of the world. The idea emerged in different civilizations created on our planet in various times and circumstances, however constantly maintaining some of its core and most specific features. We may nevertheless assume that the idea of human rights stems from two sources, one being the philosophy and the other the law. It is not our task here to research with a fair amount of accuracy what were the philosophical systems that once upon a time embraced some sort of pattern of human rights, no matter how those were named or defined within a particular school of thought. We know those schools were many. We know they came from both East and West, following different ways of reasoning, but they converged and eventually flew into rather similar conclusions. On the contrary, if we were to investigate the issue of the origin of human rights in law, that is, at least in the Western legal history, our conclusion on their date of birth leaves little room to doubts. In their modern form, the fundamental rights were brought to daylight in the time of revolutions. It is noteworthy that the great French Revolution of 1789 put forward the ideal of a universal approach to the rights as not only belonging to citizens, but first and foremost to men as such, that is, as human beings. The French were to some extent influenced by Thomas Paine, who also consecrated his famous volume to the rights of man, being himself under the impact of the American Declaration of Independence, which had proclaimed all men to be created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Despite their universal character by which the fundamental rights were marked, when entering the political scene in modern time, they were further on shaped exclusively at the national levels, being solemnly promoted in the era of traditional constitutionalism in the form of Bill of Rights enshrined in the texts of the constitutions of nation states. It was only at an advanced stage of developments that the fundamental rights, that is, human rights, were transferred to the level of international law. That process had already been in course when Malcolm X pronounced his words in a speech of 1964, less than a year before he was assassinated. He said, civil rights means you're asking Uncle Sam to treat you right. Human rights are something you were born with. Although undoubtedly true, this definition of human rights by which 
which by the way corresponds with the idea laid down by the Declaration of Independence, needed a whole set of instruments as well as adequate bodies in order to be carried out in everyday life. Bodies and instruments would not have sufficed had there not been profound convictions to back them and provide them solid grounds. Sincere beliefs of men and women created foundations to those rights once they managed to achieve a thorough transformation themselves. People have become convinced that if the human rights are the rights we are born with, they inevitably overcome nation states borders and require a more suitable environment to achieve efficient protection. Back in the 1960s, such international instruments were already in place, transferring the protection of human rights from the level of nation states to the area of international law. A tremendous step had thus been taken, and we should put it together with Samuel Moyne, a Columbia scholar, that it was, I quote, the move from the politics of the state to the morality of the globe. It was indeed in the ruins and remnants of morality that have been left at the aftermath of the World War II, while people were desperately seeking the way to restore the sense of ethics, that the human rights were given proper attention. They were then placed at the international level, an idea which fundamentally transformed some of the classical patterns reigning in the area of international law. In the first place, it meant providing direct entitlement to an individual under international law. But the phenomenon of what may be labeled as a structural alteration of human mind went far beyond the somewhat technical legal issue that has just been mentioned. The phenomenon of transformation in the human conscience may be considered to have properly found its formulation in the second half of the 1970s. In the words of Jan Patochka, a Czech dissident, who perceived the human rights as, I quote, nothing but the conviction that states and the society as a whole also consider themselves to be subject to the sovereignty of moral sentiment. Our belief today profoundly relies on such considerations, which had shown up and eventually prevailed throughout the slow and painful social developments that we had to witness in previous decades. A command of ethics to which we unequivocally agree lays down the foundations of our world and society as we know them today. Now, if we return to the everlasting story of human rights in their form of an element playing a, a significant if not even decisive role in the confrontation between the weak and the mighty, much to our regret, it seems inevitable to state that the history never ends. Although we have made our world sophisticated and managed to improve its institutions to a considerable degree, there still are among us the weak that need protection, understanding, and help. Who are the weak of today? Unfortunately, they are still numerous. Groups of men and women suffer nowadays their unfavorable life conditions and have to turn for the intervention of law in their favor to be able to cope with the hurdles they are confronted with. Two of those groups have been mentioned in the title of this symposium. The women and the youth still have to strive for equality and justice. That is why the international law should provide for adequate procedures in order to reach out to those in need and accommodate their just expectations. It should be noted at the outset that the international law has made considerable efforts to comply with its task. New areas of protection of the weak have emerged. Conventions have been adopted within the Council of Europe and several of them in the recent years to introduce protection of children and women, such as, for instance, the Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings of 2005, the Conve Convention on the Protection of Children Against Sexual Abuse 2007, or the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence of 2011. This trend of adopting conventions as a specific sort of legislative acts at the level of the European continent corresponds with those existing at the global level. 
the United Nations was the birthplace of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989, which entered into force the following year. Pursuing the path traced by the Convention and acting in the same direction, the UNICEF has declared the year of 2014 as the year of innovation for equity to focus the world's attention on showcasing and developing, in, developing innovative solutions for children's well-being. The protection of women goes hand in hand with the protection of children. The UN has made clear that violence against women is a violation of basic human rights. The UN Security Council confirmed this approach on several occasions, such as, for instance, in its Resolution 1820 of the year 2008, that condemns sexual violence in conflict areas against civilians with particular emphasis on women and girls. The references made here by no means conclude the list of relevant documents providing on human rights of women and children. The weak of today enjoy protection of the international law, especially if the treaties and res resolutions of legislative character are concerned. However, the proliferation of documents alone, no matter how noble in character and how eagerly aimed at protecting human rights, will not prove to be sufficient to carry out the task that the international law has to assume in our time. The international law in its current shape primarily needs to develop and render sophisticated the mechanisms of protection that would sustain its norms, make those effective, stand up for the weak, and provide the protection of human rights in the proper sense of the term. The mechanisms of protection of human rights are international bodies and procedures applying to the practices of those, which efficiently enable the entitled to enjoy the rights provided for by the relevant international documents. Our continent can proudly claim to be in the lead as far as the creation of such mechanisms is concerned. The European Court of Human Rights, seated here in Strasbourg, was established in 1959 and it has become, to use the words of one of its former presidents, Lucius Wildhaber, and I quote, the most effective international system of human rights protection ever developed. The Inter-American Court, with a seat in San Jose, Costa Rica, was established in 1979 and was followed later on by the African Court of Human and People's Rights, seated in Arusha, Tanzania, in 2004. The trend of creating regional bodies for protection of human rights in the form of setting up courts at continental levels has nevertheless failed to spread all over the globe, for the greatest of continents still remains without such a body. The world is waiting for Asia to take its own bold step and join the club. If the trend to create courts for human rights at continental levels remains deficient nowadays, we should not miss the opportunity to underline the fact that a tendency towards universalism in protection of human rights has shown up within the family of the United Nations. The first optional protocol to the UN Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, currently ratified by more than 100 countries, entered into force in 1976. It enabled individuals to file complaints with the UN Human Rights Committee about the alleged violations of the Covenant's provisions. The committee has developed a considerable and well-established jurisprudence in the field of human rights, and its decisions are on many occasions cited as authorities. Although usually perceived as the most efficient in protecting human rights, the courts and court-like instances are not the only actors in the field of the human rights protection. A considerable amount of contribution comes in that field from other institutions and bodies. The uh, two among those deserve to be mentioned in the first line, namely the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, established in 1993, as well as the UN Human Rights Council, set up in 2006, which by its universal periodic review assesses the situation of human rights in UN member states. What can we conclude after this survey of network of institutions operating in the area of human rights in respect of those who need help today? 
that is from the standpoint of those that remain weak and have to confront the mighty by invoking the rules of international law. Has the international law fulfilled its task or does it have to perform more? What should be our estimation of the current state of affairs in general? Have we, the citizens of our respective countries, but at the same time, members of the global community of human beings responsible for the planet and its sustainable developments, done in, have we done enough to set up and preserve institutions guaranteeing the fundamental rights to everyone? Let us be frank and modest at the same time in answering the questions that have just been posed. The international law has provided on human rights in many aspects and indeed introduced new and important fields of human rights protection. It has shown success in setting up regional courts competent for the protection of human rights, although those have not spread to all continents so far. It also developed mechanisms of such protection at the global level. Apart from judicial bodies, other intergovernmental institutions have emerged, enhancing the human right, rights protection and giving a significant contribution to the developments of modern legal and political culture. Despite all the achievements mentioned and taking into account the facts of life, and in light of the reports on many events occurring in different parts of the world that we learn either from the media or from other reliable sources of information such as NGO statements, for instance, we are bound to conclude that there are individuals who still need our help to enjoy their human rights. The current state of affairs therefore calls for action. The weak persist in our time and the old story we have met in the beginning is therefore continuing. We have transformed the pattern of human rights by elevating them to the international level of protection, made some institutions more efficient and rendered subtle the approach to certain problems. The weak nevertheless persist and the international protection of human rights remains their only hope. That is why our mission as citizens and human beings consists in raising awareness of the problem and seeking solutions to it. We are supposed to reach out to the weak and increase their hope, pursuing to strive for human rights and their protection at a global level by way of implementation of the rules of international law. The international law is nowadays by no means an area exclusively reserved for government sections. The role of non-state actors at the international scene has grown to such an extent that it is no more exaggerated to say that the international law developments call for our proper and adequate action as individuals. It should take place today, for tomorrow may be too late. When at the early stage of his visit to the Inferno, Dante meets with Francesca da Rimini, he asks her to explain her presence there and tell him her life story. Francesca agrees and makes an introduction by pronouncing the words that have become famous. She says, there is no greater pain than remembering the times of happiness while in misery. To this we should add that there is perhaps no greater misery than once the chance to act has expired to contemplate what we could have done, but indeed failed to do. Thank you.